grace of God forever. The house of God forever. We're Scott and Meg Spearling, and we're um, on video today to bring you the Change for a Dollar story. We gave Change for a Dollar to Matt and Summer Schmitz. Now, Matt is about 38 years old, and he and Summer have been married for 14 years, but we've known Matt since he was in our two and three-year-old Sunday school class with our two daughters. We also are in a small group with Matt's parents. So the reason we wanted to give the change for a dollar to Matt is because about a month or two ago, he went into the doctor uh, complaining of some symptoms. The doctor said, you're depressed. Um, just, we can give you medication, but he didn't want that. But his symptoms got worse. And so he eventually went back to the doctor. The doctor sent him to get an MRI. The technician at the MRI uh, that viewed the MRI sent him directly to the hospital and the next day he was at Stanford getting brain surgery for a tumor about the size of an adult fist. Um, they were able to get most of the tumor out but Matt has to go through a significant amount of chemotherapy and radiation and Matt and Summer have two small children six and eight year old nine, six, six and nine year old and so we figured they really could use some encouragement from the body of Christ. So we asked Pastor Andy if we could give them the change for a dollar. And he, he knows them and he graciously uh, said, yes, let's do it. So there were actually two different amounts. There were two different amounts. Um, the first um, amount that um, they received from change for a dollar was $528. And then um, Pastor Andy was very sweet and he said that we could leave the buckets out the next week for, for Matt and Summer. So that's what we did. And then it gave the online people uh, opportunity to give online as well. So um, after the second giving, that was uh, $714.11. So we're able to bless Matt and Summer with $1,242.11. That just blows my mind because it's just means so much to them. And just so that you, you all know that you're all part of the blessing. And that's what's, um, that's what's really exciting about it. And um, I talked to Summer on the phone. Um, they have a lot of um, appointments, so it's really hard to catch them at home. So um, I did talk to her on the phone and she was just totally blown away by the fact that people she doesn't even know were willing to help them and bless them in that way. And um, we'll probably never know how much it means to them, but just know that you guys are all part of the blessing. And um, it's not, not just us giving the money, but it's all of you all are part of that blessing to Matt and Summer, and it really means a lot to them. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, and blessings to all of you. Good morning, church. So good to have you here. I'm Andy Rock. I'm a pastor here at Coastal Community Church. I get to be a part of an incredible team of amazing men and women that just love Jesus and love you. And we're so glad that you're here this morning. Let me remind you once again why it is that we do what we do. What, what's the DNA of our church? We find this in Isaiah 61. Here's the story. Number one, that there is hope beyond our brokenness. That for all of us who are bound up, all of us who are blind, all of us who are in need of restoration and rescue, which is every single one of us, that the Spirit of God comes upon us to proclaim good news to us, to set us captives free, to rescue us. That's the heartbeat of what we believe, that there is hope beyond our brokenness. 
Second, what we see in Scripture is that in, in Isaiah 61, as the passage goes on, is that we get to trust our risen Savior. Jesus is alive, working, present tense in our lives right now. And you and I get to be on a journey, this amazing roller coaster ride called life, where we get to trust Him in the ups and downs of all that life has to offer. And then finally, God invites us right where we are, right now, to bring restoration to this weary world. And so this week, I'm so glad that you've tuned in. Uh, I know that whenever you're watching this sermon, either uh, on a Sunday morning or in the week to come, I know that we have a national election. Have you heard? Yeah, there's an election happening. And so just know that God is in control and that God is working all things for good and that you and I get to participate in something magical and that is to cast our vote to elect someone that we believe that will pursue the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything that his kingdom is about and I know that sometimes the candidate that we uh, that we would love to have isn't on the ballot and we're stuck with uh, alternatives that maybe we don't really know or like or appreciate um, so pray, ask Jesus, uh, who do you want me to vote for? And I trust that whoever you vote for, uh, that your heart and my heart are aligned, that we want to see God's kingdom come. So God bless you in this week where you get to be a citizen and uh, to vote and to, to be engaged. So please do, please do that. A disciple in our church chooses to walk intentionally with God. We engage. It's just like being a citizen. You have to make a choice to engage. A disciple is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And in the kingdom of heaven, what we do is that we choose to be changed by Jesus. We choose to seek Jesus first. And we choose to join Jesus in his resurrection work. And I see you doing this, and I'm so grateful for you. Way to go. Keep on going. You're doing such an amazing job as a church. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for all that you're doing for God's kingdom. A uh, quick announcement here this morning. If you are new to our church, I want to invite you to join us uh, this coming Wednesday on the 4th. And then the next week after that on the 11th and the next week after that on the 18th at 6.30 p.m. for Coastal Core. Coastal Core is a chance for brand new people to our church to understand what we believe, understand how we function as a church, what we're up to, and then also, also to experience hope, experience trust, and experience restoration. At the end also, it's an amazing chance to be able to form small groups or community groups, DNA groups, where you can find brand new people that you relate with and that you connect. So we're going to feed you dinner. So if you can, please RSVP. It's in the church email, or you can go at, on to mycoastal.org, and there will, you, they'll, you'll find under events uh, an opportunity with Coastal Core to sign up. So please um, let us know what you'd like to do. And even if you want to make a comment in the live stream, sign me up. That'll work as well. We monitor all those comments and we'll put your name in the hat, okay? So let's pray before we do anything else. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray for this message right now as we come before you. Uh, we pray, God, that you would open our ears and our eyes to all that you want us to hear today. Lord, I know that this passage of Scripture in the book of Daniel will challenge us and so I pray that when we get defensive or dismissive or start applying this message to our spouse or our kids or our neighbors or our friends, God, that you would redirect the focus so that we might apply this to ourselves. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Free us. Deliver us. And God, as a church, we pray for this weary world. We pray for a vaccine for this virus. We pray for our nation. We pray peace upon our nation. We pray against the division that is in our country. We pray, God, that people would see the glory and the beauty of who you are and the gift of America and what a precious gift it is to be an American. We pray that you would heal. Pray that you'd bring justice. 
We pray that you would renew communities that are so weary and so tired and they've had such little opportunities. Lord, help bring resurrection to our nation. And God, for those that we don't agree with, we pray that, I pray right now, that you would give us all the compassion and all the love and all the mercy and all the patience and all the wisdom that we need. Lord, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done this time right now on earth as it is in heaven for this moment that we have together but then also in the days and weeks to come for our nation in christ's name we pray amen so if you were with us last week we read daniel chapter 3 and in daniel chapter 3 uh, you remember how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, our boys, have walked out of this furnace without a scratch. Why were, why were they thrown into a furnace? They were thrown there because King Nebuchadnezzar has, um, has ordered that everybody worship this 90-foot tall statue of him. And so when King Nebuchadnezzar throws the boys into, our boys, into this furnace, he sees an angel, or in his words, one who looks like a son of the gods, standing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the boys walk out, and there's, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, many commentators would say that this was Jesus himself. I, I think, I believe, I can't prove it, but I think it was Jesus himself. He was with our boys. It was absolutely wonderful. So do you remember what happened? Well, so we're going to pick up right, at, right after our boys come out. Now, for the sake of time, Nebuchadnezzar is a mouthful. And so in our staff meeting, our, one of our staff members, um, uh, Zedekiah, our, our minister of worship, nicknamed Nebuchadnezzar Little Nebs. And so uh, Matt, Little Nebs. Thank you, Matt. So if I say Little Nebs, it was me that named it Little, little Nebs. Oh, <laughs> I'm Zed, Zed called him Nebby. I'm sorry. And I said the Minister of Magic little, Matt called him Little Nebs. Let's just leave that in. Don't edit this little exchange out. <laughs> Zedekai is not that clever. He's not that clever. So. I might say little nebs a couple of times today because the minister of magic has said so. Uh, and in those cases, know that I'm talking about Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> so ridiculous. Verse 28. Here we go. You ready? Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trust him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. And this is classic little nebs, oh, right? Yeah! He's saying the right things. Ah, oh, praise God. But then Nebuchadnezzar threatens death, literally, I'll pull your arms off to anyone who badmouths God. Why is Lil Nebs like this? What? Well, it's because he, he has no idea what a relationship with God actually is. The Babylonians, just like many Americans, think God is way out there rather than right here. And when God is way out there, you start to think about that God in funny ways. For example, that God only shows up in rare moments. They're called miracles, where in everyday life, you basically just run your life as though God is, that God is absent. When prayer is answered, it's like that God sort of he was eating dinner and a heavenly morsel fell off his plate and tumbled down from heaven and somehow you got lucky and that landed in your lap. Otherwise, you're functionally alone and life is up to you. 
What you say about that God is more important than knowing God's heart or how you treat others. That's why Nebuchadnezzar can say, don't disrespect that God, God, otherwise I'll rip your arms off. What Nebuchadnezzar doesn't yet understand is that our God, the true God, the real God, is intently involved and interested in every detail of your life. Our God is present here, now, with you, right now, like literally with you, right now, always. And our God is far more interested in that you would know his heart, and thus that would then shape how you treat yourself and others than a momentary slip of your tongue. But let me put it this way. Spiritual immaturity is speaking the language of following God, but our God talk rarely translates to obedience. Spiritual immaturity is speaking the language of following God, but our God talk rarely translates to obedience. Spiritual maturity is consistently choosing God, His way, and His heart, while honestly describing your failures and successes. Again, spiritual maturity is consistently choosing God's way and pursuing God's heart while honestly describing our failures and successes along the way. So, how do we become spiritually mature? Well, there are two paths towards maturity, or let me put it this way, there's two teachers um, uh, of maturity. The first teacher is called listening and obedience, and this teacher requires your attention and discipline. Uh, the first teacher, listening and obedience, requires that you, when you hear something, that you would then stop, absorb it, understand it, and then make different choices based on this new information. The second teacher is called pain. The second teacher called pain gets our attention after we've wrecked our lives upon the jagged rocks called consequences. Now you have the choice of how you want to learn. You can become spiritually mature through listening and obedience or through pain. And today's passage shows us these two teachers, these two paths towards spiritual maturity very clearly. So watch carefully here and listen carefully as we read Daniel chapter 4 together today. Daniel chapter 4 verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. So first notice who's writing. It's Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel writes chapters 1 through 3, but chapter 4 is written, that's right, a chapter in God's holy word is written by a terrorist, by a despot, by a dictator, by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. So how is this possible? Like what happened? Well, let's find out as we continue to read. Verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar is writing now, this is his voice. I want you to know all about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. This is incredible. Notice how Nebuchadnezzar is praising God, like our God, Yahweh, not his native gods like Aku or Molech or Nebo. This, this could be a mark of spiritual maturity because there's no death, death threats, at least yet. Spiritual maturity starts with you understanding that the moment you say yes to Christ, you are in Christ. What does that mean? Being in Christ is this wonderful state in which God provides for you and me just as God provided for Jesus. And Jesus never worried about whether or not he was enough or loved or worthy or accepted. Jesus knows right now, he believes right now that he is God's beloved son, his beloved child. And therefore, Jesus is at peace. And the moment that you say yes to Jesus, the moment that your journey of spiritual maturity starts, where you begin to 
know and then also start to trust, aka believe, that you really are worthy of love right now, that you're chosen, that you're enough, that you're forgiven, that you can put your weight on God's plans and purposes and provision for you. And Jesus shows us what this looks like because he knows that he's secure as God's son. And so for you and I to be in Christ, that's us too being secure as God's beloved child. And because you're okay, which is shockingly wonderful and delightful, you can't help but praise God. A sign of spiritual maturity is that your heart and your mind are focused and locked in on God, not on you. So praising God becomes important to you because of everything that God has done for you. And Nebuchadnezzar shockingly is showing a measure of spiritual maturity by praising God. How in the world does this happen? Let's keep on reading. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. Oh my gosh, is that it again? Verse 7, when all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream. Oh, that's different. He actually tells them this time. But they could not tell me what it meant. At at last, verse 8, at last Daniel came in before me and I told him the dream. So Daniel shows up once again to, to rescue the day. I love it. Verse 10, uh, what's, what is the dream all about? Quote, while I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth and the tree grew very tall and strong. And verse 12, all the world was fed from this tree. So here's this massive tree. It's enormous. It's the size of a continent and uh, it's got lots of life and it's feeding everybody that's underneath it. Verse 13, then as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, that's an angel, who, verse 14, who shouted, cut down the tree and lop off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit, chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump. Now let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field. Oh, how interesting. Notice a couple of things. This tree becomes a him at the end in verse 15. The tree becomes a man and the tree gets cut down and is drenched with dew. Well, that means that you're sleeping outside. So a man who was, whose life was full of life and fruit and protection has now been cut down homeless. The man will fall. Verse 16. For seven periods of time, let him, let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. So the angel is saying this man will be cut down, become homeless, lose everything. And for seven years, he'll go nuts. He'll, he'll lose his humanity, basically. Verse 19, Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. The tree you saw growing was very tall and very strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. This is verse 22. That tree, your majesty, is you. So once again, Daniel has to tell little Neb's bad news. What? Last time Daniel told the king that his kingdom would fade and God's kingdom lasts forever. Do you remember what, what happened? Because the dream was about this large statue. What did, what, did Daniel, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, he built a 90 foot tall golden statue and then made everyone worship it under the threat of tossing anyone into a furnace who refused. So this time Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, you will fail. You will fall. You'll lose your mind, and for seven years, you'll wander around like an animal. Your glory will end. Wow. Verse 27. King Nebuchadnezzar, this is Daniel speaking now to the king. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then 
you will continue to prosper. Now, Daniel would have known the Proverbs. Those are the sayings or the wise words of King Solomon. Proverbs 12, 15 says this, Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Daniel is warning the king. Daniel warns us. God warns us. And here's the thing. Remember, fools think their own way, but the wise listen to others. God, in his wisdom, is constantly speaking to you, warning you, hoping, praying, urging you to listen. And what does Daniel say to the king? Well, it's the same thing that God says to you. Break from the rebellion that you've been in. Stop what you know to be sin. And then turn and be merciful to the poor. See, when you give to the poor, what ends up happening is that you'll start caring for them. You start being invested in them because you're giving something that's valuable to you. That's your money and time to them. And when you give to the poor, you know what you'll find out? You'll find out that some of them are poor because of bad luck. Some of them are poor because they got sick. Some of them are poor because someone else robbed them or stole them or ruined their life. Some of them are poor because they've made really, really bad choices. Some of them are poor because they got a dealt a bad hand. They are suffering with mental illness. Some of them are poor because they've had a lack of education. Some people are poor because they've been systemically oppressed because the people in power and control never wanted them to be able to rise up. And when you see that, what you'll realize is that the poor are just like the rich. Some people become rich because of good luck. Some people become rich because of good choices. Some people become rich because they have the benefit of pushing other people down. Some people become rich because they became the recipients of good education. To have mercy on the poor is to see that you are no different, that just as they need mercy, so you too also need mercy. The result of refusing to listen to God's consistent warnings is always disaster. We know this. And the disaster that God wants to save us from isn't his punishment. The disaster that he wants to save us from is the natural consequences of assuming that you and I could play with death and not have death touch us. Does that make sense? When God warns you, it's not because he's going to punish you. It's because he sees you playing with death and he knows that you can't get away with that without being infected and harmed. In the summer of 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea off the southern coast of Russia. Over 400 passengers died as they were hurled into the icy waters below. And news of the disaster was further darkened when an investigation revealed the cause of the accident. It wasn't a technology problem like radar malfunction. It wasn't a weather problem like thick fog. It wasn't a mechanical problem like a prop got stuck. It was caused by human pride. Each captain was aware of the other ship's presence nearby. And neither captain wanted to give way to the other. And they would not listen to each other as they both got on the radio screaming at each other. And by the, by the time that they came to their senses, it was too late. The ships crashed into each other and 400 people died. God does not want you to crash your life. And so he's going to warn you. Are you listening? Verse 29. Twelve months later. King Nebuchadnezzar was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. This is amazing. King Nebuchadnezzar is given a full, solid year to heed God's warning. Isn't that gracious? Isn't that incredible? It's not like God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream and then if he didn't respond two seconds later, then boom, down comes the hammer. No, he gives him a year. This is incredible. So remember the two paths to spiritual maturity. One is listen and obey. The second is pain. I'll give you, I'll give you a moment to guess which teacher Nebuchadnezzar chooses. 
Verse 30, as Nebuchadnezzar looked out across the, 30, uh, across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. <laughs> he's just like oozing with pride. It's just like coming out of him. And he's forgotten totally about praising God. He's forgot about the God who interprets his dreams. He's forgot about the God who like literally rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from a fiery furnace. It does not matter. Nebuchadnezzar is praising himself and it's ugly, isn't it? It's so gross. Ronald Reagan, when he was Cal governor of California, he made a speech in Mexico City. This is in the uh, late 1970s. And he said, Reagan said this in his memoir, after I had finished speaking, I sat down to a rather unenthousi unenthusiastic applause and I was a little embarrassed. And the speaker who followed me spoke in Spanish, which I totally didn't understand. And he was being applauded about like every paragraph. And to hide my embarrassment, this is Reagan, he says, to hide my embarrassment, I started clapping before everyone else and longer than everyone else until our ambassador to Mexico leaned over and said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. He's interpreting your speech. <laughs> like pride is ugly, even if it's unintentional. Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of us when we are stuck in our pride. Now, you probably don't walk onto your balcony and gush over your magnificent kingdom and say, look at all these potted plants I have made. Look at this beautiful quarter acre plot that I've yet to pay the mortgage on. Nor do you probably applaud yourself after every one of your sentences. But that's not a reason to dismiss God's warning over pride. Because pride doesn't look obvious like this. Pride sounds like this. It's all up to me. No one else will, so I've got to. No one else cares, only me. No one else knows how, only I can do it. I've got to, I need to, I have to. I, 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 I. If you had two armies facing each other and one soldier ran out by himself to attack all alone, what would you call that? You'd call it suicide. And that's pride. Pride is the vain and blind suicide of run of, of me trying to fight all my battles of my own, of me trying to run my world on my own, of me assuming that no one else cares or no one else can help or no one else is with me. Pride will never tell me that I'm designed to fight the good fight with God by my side, with God providing all the resources that I need at his timing, with God working through me. And pride will never tell me that God has designed me to fight the good fight with other friends by my side, with others on my team, shoulder to shoulder with the people that God has given me. Spiritual immaturity is pride that the focus is on me. And that's the heartbeat of religion. I do fill in the blank. And then God will bless me. And so the focus isn't on God's blessing. The focus is on me and what I do. Spiritual maturity focuses on God. It glorifies God. Maturity praises God because, because the heartbeat of the gospel says this. Jesus accomplished for me what I could not. Obeyed for me when I rebelled. And Jesus has given me all of his right standing and therefore I praise him and I glorify him and I submit to my life to him because he's my savior and Lord and King. So back to Nebuchadnezzar, gazing across the city, glorifying himself. Verse 31, while these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdom of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. Whoa. God humbles 
King Nebuchadnezzar. You could also say it this way. King Nebuchadnezzar has dehumanized himself and he's become no better than an animal in his thinking because an animal only thinks about themselves and their survival. He thinks he's God and that's insane. And anytime a leader thinks this, he will be humbled. And we can all see it. Like you and I can always see it when a leader gets too big for his britches and starts to get humbled. No wonder Nebuchadnezzar will lose his kingdom. No one will follow and support that kind of pride for long. Verse 33, that same hour, the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven and he lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. <clears throat> so here's the picture of Nebuchadnezzar, homeless, without a kingdom, living like an animal, crazier than a hoot owl. And if we stop the story here, the basic plot line of religion or religiosity would make sense because religion says this, obey God and God will bless you, disobey and God will curse you. And there's a, there's a little bit of truth in that because <clears throat> what sticks is that what we understand is that our actions actually do have consequences. We know this. If you drop an anvil on your foot, you're going to break your foot. That's how it works. But when the formula of religion is applied to your and I's faith, this is what it looks like. You were lost. Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins. All of that's true. Here's the wacky part. Now it's your job to maintain what God has given you. The lie of religiosity is that we've been brought out of debt. And once you're out of debt, how much money do you have? Zero dollars. Well, praise God, you don't have minus a hundred thousand, but now you got zero. And religion, this is where religiosity sneaks in. Religiosity says, <clears throat> now, dear Christian, it is up to you to deposit into your account everything that you need. So get busy with your good works. Get busy with your perfection. Get busy with being everyone to, or everything to everyone. And we hope that if we do enough right things and we recycle and we vote for the right person and we, we give up our parking spots at Trader Joe's and we put in our little offering at church and we say the right prayer, if we do all those things, then God will bless us. And then, but the question is, is how much is enough? And we know the answer. It's never enough. And so we always feel this guilt, this weight, this sense of unworthiness, this sense of, oh my gosh, um, uh, uh, exhaustion. And, and we get then angry that we're never enough. And we're always afraid that we're just one step, one mistake away from being tossed out of God's favor, just like Nebuchadnezzar was. I know the hiss of these lies. They're called unworthiness, it's called pride, it's called shame, it's called fear. And the gospel says that not only has Jesus forgiven my sins, so I'm out of debt, but, 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 Jesus also has deposited into my account everything that he has earned, his righteousness. So now I have, I have billions of dollars. I have so much good in my life because of what Jesus has done. I, I cannot spend it. There is no need for me to exhaust myself trying to maintain my own worthiness and perfection. My worthiness and perfection is a gift given to me by God himself. My sins and my perfection are totally fulfilled by Jesus. And so you and I are worthy and beloved and forgiven and chosen enough because Jesus gives each one of these things to us is a gift. Verse 34. After seven years had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. He prays. It takes him seven years. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar prays. The next sentence says this. My sanity returned. And I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. 
His rule is everlasting and His kingdom is eternal. <sighs> Isn't this beautiful? Nebuchadnezzar gets rescued. He gets redeemed. He gets saved. I'm Nebuchadnezzar. When I was hired as your pastor, I had spent nearly a decade in the wilderness of religion, and I was shocked to discover that I was totally driven by fear and unworthiness and shame and a whole lot of pride trying to fix and save me and you and everybody else. And what I had wished more than anything is that during this time of the wilderness is that I could have the mercy to not have it all together. I could have the grace to change into who I always wanted to become. And that I would have time to work on this without condemnation. And this is exactly what the book of Daniel in chapter four communicates to you and I. God asks us to have the humility to admit that we don't have it all together. And then God promises to us his grace and love and then God gives us the time that we need to hear it and understand. And even if we don't, even if we reject God, even if we stand over our lives and say, oh, it's all about me. Look how great I am. Yeah, we might lose our minds for a bit, but the moment we turn to heaven and pray, God will restore to us all that we have lost. I've learned something else since God has restored me to sanity. And this is it. Spiritual maturity is not, never, ever, ever going it alone. We always go together. Always together. You and I are not meant to grow in Christ isolated. We're meant to grow as friends in conversation together as, as a church that you would have two, three, four, five people in your life that, that you could talk about the deep things and pray through the hard things. You're never meant to do it alone. That's literally the function of this church. That's our job is to connect you with people that will be by your side no matter what. Now, this is the craziest verse, verse 36. This is the craziest verse in the entire book of Daniel. Little Nebs writes this, verse 36. When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Here's why this is crazy. You have politicians in your mind right now or dictators or leaders that you know for sure are going to hell, <laughs> right? You just know, and they might be on the right. They might be on the left. It doesn't matter. You just know that like when, when they die, they're going to open up their eyes. They're going to be in hell and they're going to go. Yeah, I knew. Here's what's crazy. Who deserves hell the most? It's the guy who rips people's arms off unless they obey. It's the guy who throws innocent people into furnaces. And what happens to this Nebuchadnezzar? God saves him. God rescues him. God has mercy on him. And this is the good news of the gospel. Look, when the gospel sinks into your heart and mind, when, when the good news that you are loved even when you crash your life into the shoals of rebellion finally sinks in. When the good news that you don't have to earn it anymore sinks in. When the good news that God isn't after your punishment, but is actually rather after your blessing finally sinks in. When the good news that you're enough, that you are loved, that you are God's beloved sinks in. When the good news that Jesus, the King of Kings, willingly humbled himself to the point of death on a cross for you, sinks in. There's only going to one thing that you're going to want to do. It's to give God all the glory while being honest about your failures 
and your successes. And that's spiritual maturity. Verse 37, last verse. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the King of heaven. All his acts are just and true because he is able to humble the proud. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for the moments where you humble us that you would deliver and free us and break off that ridiculous pride that we have. God, forgive us for our pride. Forgive me for my pride. Deliver me from my pride. Grant me the ease to talk about my failures and my successes the ugly parts of my life and the beautiful parts of my life. God, grant me the courage to reach out to my friends and not go it alone, to risk being vulnerable and honest. Lord, I need you. And Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for bringing me to this church. Thank you for these incredible people who've loved me back to life. Would you bless and seal all these good things that have been spoken and sung over them today in their hearts and grow them into a beautiful tree that would bring life and shelter and peace and hope to everyone who's under it. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much for loving me back to life. And now I pray God's benediction over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, that's his delight in you, and give you the peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to invite you, friends, to join us right now for our communion during live stream. Pastor Paul and Matt, our Minister of Magic, will be leading us this morning in our communion live stream. So if you can, get up, go grab some bread or some grape juice if you have it. Uh, whatever elements work for you in your house, grab those uh, and then meet us back here. We'll do live stream at 1015 a.m. God bless you all. Thank you so much for all that you do for our church. I love you. Uh, stay tuned for the outtakes. Take care.
Ready? Good morning, church. So good to have you here. I'm Andy Rock. I'm the pastor. Uh, let me start that over again. So, so bad. Good morning, church. Standing that the moment that you say yes to Jesus, you are in Christ. <laughs> there was a little tick, and you went. What was that? You started looking around. And then. I'm trying to hold on, and all you're doing is like. <laughs> Spiritual mess. Come on! Feel it! Oh, oh, ow! How dare you awaken the great Pata Penko, oh, the 90s so nice vampire! To meet you. Where is the blood drive? I'm so hungry! There is no blood drive, but there is this. (laughs) (laughs) 
I don't know if that's what <laughs> Why did you start talking in a vampire voice, Luke? He <laughs> <laughs> was gonna go with it. A pat pilot. Oh, ow. Sorry. It's really hot under this thing, Matt. <laughs> I feel like I'm Please really, hurry. I feel like I'm really selling myself to this role. Okay. Oh, it's so hot. I had thoughts anyway. That part. Okay, here we go. Ready? <laughs> it's really hot in here, okay. guys. All right. So, like, this is hard work, and I feel just like I should get paid for just being the actor here. And so, this is a heavy, a heavy <laughs> thing. This is a heavy thing to bear. No, okay. it's like a thick. It's very insulated. No. Oh. There's gonna be a photo booth. We can do fun photos with our friends. There's gonna be. Um... That will not work for me. I do not show up in the pictures. Great. So, back to time. So, everybody, Pot of Panko and I, 5.30 to 7.30. Dude, <laughs> 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 oh, we're right there! That's good. It, it, we'll do it. Let's shoot this bad boy in 4K. Okay, man, let's do it. Ooh, baby! That what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we! Excuse this the is just all. <laughs> Excuse We're the all going to see this on Sunday. I mean. uh, man, it is really, it is really warm.